brother. Thank you. Thank you, Brother McAllister. It's good to be here tonight. I'm uh, very excited to be here and grateful for the honor that you've given me to come and be a part of these uh, lectures. And thank you for those kind words. Brother McAllister and my dad uh, were together in the seminary in Little Rock a uh, hundred years ago or so, something like that. And uh, uh, so uh, I've known Brother McAllister basically all of my life and known of him and uh, admire the work that he's done for our Lord and is doing for our uh, Lord. The past five months, I'm telling Brother McAllister today, have been something. Uh, my mom passed away uh, August the 19th. And then December the 16th, my dad passed away, uh, who had been preaching for 54 years. And uh, my mom had been married 60 years. And then three weeks ago, we learned that my wife has breast cancer. But I'm here to tell you that our God is good. And that uh, the words of this book are true. His grace is sufficient. I'd like for us to pray together. Father, we bow to thank you for the blessings that we've enjoyed today. We thank you for your grace and mercy and for the gift of eternal life that we enjoy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Father, we thank you that uh, we can offer the gospel of Jesus Christ to lost people in good faith that if they hear and believe, they'll be saved. We thank you, Father, that when Christ died, He died for the sins of the whole world. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for your churches and the work they do. And we pray, Father, that the fires of personal evangelism might burn in our hearts. Yes. And we pray, God, that we would seize every opportunity you give us to be a faithful witness for you. May your churches be revived. And may we see many come to know the Lord. May you receive all of the honor and the glory is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Dr. Raymond McAllister and faculty and staff of the Emmaus Baptist College, please accept my heartfelt thanks for the privilege you've given me to come and be part of these lectures. I bring you greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ from Northern Hills Baptist Church in Texarkana, Arkansas and from the Missionary Baptist Seminary in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's always a joy for me to be able to come and to visit our sister schools and to fellowship with God's people. I am in favor of an educated ministry. I believe our preachers need to be trained and taught. I didn't say call them, but we can train them and we can teach them. I'm not like that one guy I heard about who stood up and prayed and he said, God, I thank you for my ignorance and I ask you to make me more ignorant. And uh, one dear lady out in the congregation said, that's one prayer God surely answered. <laughs> I believe our men need to be educated. And I'm thankful for the work of Emmaus Baptist College and her work of training men for the ministry. The task of speaking about Calvinism is not simple. It's not as easy to speak about Calvinism as one might think. And one of the primary reasons that it is difficult is because of the sheer differences of interpretation that exist within the ranks of Calvinism itself. For example, some would say that they are hyper-Calvinists, while others would say that they are two-point Calvinists. So throughout the course of these lectures, please keep in mind that not all self-proclaimed Calvinists believe exactly the same thing. I believe in all things we ought to be fair and honest. We ought not say that somebody believes something when they don't believe it. So I want to be, with the help of the Lord, to be fair and honest. And as I prepared these lectures, that was my prayer, that it would not become just some emotional response but it would be something that would be truthful and that would be helpful. I purport in this first lecture to deal with the history of Calvinism among Baptists. In the second, the second lecture, we'll deal with the five points of Calvinism. And the last lecture, we'll deal with what missionary Baptists believe. And we will look at our doctrinal statement, what we say 
about the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The study of church history is necessary but messy. And if you've read anything at all in uh, church history books, you know that it is not all cut and dried. It's not all neat and well packaged. The study of church history can be messy and it can be surprising and it can be unsettling if we're not careful. Missionary Baptist churches believe in the perpetuity of the Lord's church. We believe when Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, that that was the Lord promising from the days that He started the church until the day that He comes, the Lord's church will be intact. Amen. However, when we look in the pages of church history, we can't look for churches that had Baptists on their sign and started Sunday school at 10 o'clock. We choose to identify ourselves in the pages of church history with those who were persecuted, not those who were doing the persecuting. I mention all of that to let you know, in case there's any question, I do not consider myself to be a Protestant. I am a Baptist. I am not a Protestant. While our forefathers have not always been called Baptists, they have been true to the New Testament pattern of church and doctrine. Much of what I'll share with you tonight and in this lecture comes from my own personal study, from personal conversations with and notes shared uh, with me from Dr. Terry Parrish, Professor of Church History at the Missionary Baptist Seminary in Little Rock. Calvinism is so named after one of the leaders of the Reformation, John Calvin. John Calvin is referred to as the father of Reformed and Presbyterian doctrine and theology. However, there have been many forms of Calvinism since Calvin. The doctrines of election and predestination advocated by Calvin did not come from Calvin himself. Instead, Calvin learned them from the writings of Augustine of Hippo, the bishop of the first century. Augustine was responsible for the fatalism that exists in many, fifth, uh, many faiths today. And at best, Augustine was a heretic. Calvin the Reformer was a trained Roman Catholic priest. And even though he was a leader in Reformed theology, he never forsook his pedo-baptism or his sacerdotal means of grace beliefs. In fact, there are those who claim that if you have, uh, if you have not forsaken these aspects of Calvinism, then you are not a true Calvinist, but you are merely Calvinistic. A book that I recommend is titled, Whosoever Will. And in this book, Whosoever Will, Kevin Kennedy wrote uh, one of the chapters titled, Was Calvin a Calvinist? In this article he wrote, and I quote, the term Calvinism obscures the fact that Reformed theology owes its, its existence to any significant churchmen and theologians, end of quote. When speaking of the particular Tulip doctrine that so identifies Calvinism, Kennedy wrote, quote, therefore since these points were articulated over a half century after Calvin's death, and since they represent a consensus among many Reformed theologians, the question would naturally arise whether the five points of Calvinism actually represent the fault of Calvin himself. This would lead one to wonder if Calvin himself would be identified with the extreme Calvinism that is so tenaciously held to today. The five points of Calvinism defined as the Tulip Doctrine came into existence in the Synod of Dort in 1619. This was 55 years after the death of, of Calvin. I want you to get what I just said. The five points of Calvinism did not exist until 55 years after Calvin died. So I'm going to ask you a question. Could then, if the five points of Calvinism defi uh, define Calvinism, they didn't come about until 55 years after Calvin died, could he have been a Calvinist? 
I'll say more about that tomorrow. <laughs> Who then defines Calvinism? The doctrine we now call Calvinism has many authors and advocates. The Calvinism of our day has had its rise in the popular culture by the writings of men who place an emphasis on the tulip doctrine and not necessarily on the whole Reformed theology. Baptists should have great difficulty with the whole Reformed theology as advocated by the theological descendants of Calvin. Let me say it again. If you are a Baptist, you ought to have great difficulty with the whole uh, theological construct of Calvinism because Calvin believed in the marriage between church and state. He believed in sprinkling babies, pedo baptism, and he believed that the ordinances were sacramental. They were a means of grace. I do not know of any self-respecting Baptist that believes that. Amen. Amen. And even if they do believe it, I don't know what they are, but I know what they ain't. They ain't Baptists. Amen. Contemporary Calvinism has many sides. Roger Olson wrote, and I quote, Contemporary popular Calvinism may be, by and large, consistent with Calvin and many of his followers, although I think it is even more shaped by his successor, as chief pastor at Geneva, Theodore Beza, and his followers. But it is, not, it is not the only version of Reformed theology and Calvinism. This new Calvinism seems to be rising on college campuses, and it is rising in the preaching and theology of many contemporary churches. Many of our people listen to men like John MacArthur, and John Piper, and they are Calvinists. Yeah. Many reasons have been set forth to substantiate why there is a rise of Calvinism today. Some of this writing has been done in Christian magazines. For example, Colin Henson wrote one of these articles in Christianity Today and makes the following comments, quote, Calvinists, like their namesake, Reformation theologian John Calvin, Stress that the initiative, sovereignty, and power of God is the only sure hope for sinful people and morally weak human beings. Furthermore, they teach that the glory of God is the ultimate theme of preaching and focus of worship. He then added, the new Calvinists are reacting to what they regard as a general decline of theology and especially emphasis on God's glory in contemporary American church life. Olson quoted another critic of the New Calvinists by saying that Billings decried the New Calvinism's one-sided focus on some of Reformed theology's more exotic doctrines, and especially the Tulip scheme. Now with this overview of Calvin and the New Calvinism, this sets the stage for our view into Baptist history and Calvinism. As I said a moment ago, church history presents a messy picture when it comes to defining what a Baptist is in every century. Baptists are people with very distinctive beliefs. Baptists are a people of the book. We hold without any reservation to the doctrine of verbal, plenary inspiration of Scripture. Because of that, we may have doctrinal statements and confessions of faith, but we never have creeds. We believe that the Bible is our rule of faith and practice. Because we look to the Bible, we have a baseline to which we can return on all doctrinal issues. This does not, however, exclude the fact that we have had theological disagreements and discussions and splits. The issue of Calvinism and its influence in Baptist life illustrates this diverse and often controversial part of Baptist life. Since the Reformation, Baptists have struggled with the issue of Calvinism. In England, as the Reformation progressed and Baptists emerged from the persecution and started to come to light, their doctrinal positions were divergent. First, the general Baptists had an Armenian flavor about their teachings. Second, the particular Baptists had a Calvinistic flavor in their teachings. Many of the Puritans would leave the Church of England, and as they read their Bibles, they started practicing Baptist ways. 
These would then separate from the Puritan or congregational churches and form their own Baptist versions. These were called separate Baptists. The, they would embrace immersion for baptism of a believer only. They would require a regenerated church membership. However, this does not necessarily mean they changed all of their doctrinal positions. This provided for an interesting doctrinal suit for these early churches. The churches that were thoroughly Baptist and came out of the persecution were influenced by these new Baptists. The particular Baptist, once the persecution started to wane, began to write and publish. In fact, the first and second London, uh, London Confessions of Faith were heavily Calvinistic in their articles concerning salvation. These influences came with the Baptists as they crossed the Atlantic and made their way to the colonies. The remaining part of this lecture will discuss the influence of the history of Calvinism on the churches of the colonies and the rest of the United States. John Clark started the first Baptist church in the colonies in 1638 in Rhode Island. The Calvinism of the Puritans and the particular Baptists heavily influenced Dr. Clark. With the arrival of the first great awakening of the early 1700s, the Baptists were starting to flourish and they were beginning to see great growth. With the arrival of the first great, great awakening, they were seeing great numbers. However, it must be kept in mind that this was not a Baptist revival. The first great awakening, as great as it was, was not a Baptist revival. Men such as Cotton, Mathers, Stoddard, Edwards were the main theologians of the era, and they were all Puritan divines. There was not a Baptist among them. However, Isaac Bacchus was converted and for years served as a historian and strong advocate of Baptist belief mixed with a strict congregationalist view. He bequeathed to the Baptist a strong ecclesiology that would later influence the landmark movement. The growth and spread of Baptist in the colonies after the First Great Awakening brought about interesting developments with regard to the doctrine of Calvinism. Gregory, Gregory A. Willis in his book Democratic Religion writes of the development of these differences, quote, the Philadelphia Baptist Association also sent to the South such evangelists as Morgan Edwards and John Gano, who established regular, formerly known as particular Baptist churches, often by persuading the scattered general Baptist congregations to adopt Calvinist views. As these churches interact they reached a stage in the early 1800s where they had set aside the Calvinistic doctrines to form the United Baptist Association that would not take their differences into account on an associational level. In other words, what they said was, you're more Calvinist than we are, we're not as Calvinistic as you are, but for the purpose of associating together, let's allow all of these to just melt away and will not make a difference in what we believe. This would set the tone for the doctrinal positions of many Baptists until the New Hampshire Confession that would come out in 1833. The New Hampshire Confession was less Calvinistic than the Philadelphia Confession. Neither would give any place to easy believism that was so prevalent in the 20th century uh, by some Baptists. David Benedict in his book, 50 Years Among the Baptists, wrote, Our old Baptist divines, especially those of British descent, were generally strong Calvinists as to their doctrinal creed. And but a few of them felt at liberty to call upon sinners in plain terms to repent and believe the gospel on account of their inability to do so without divine assistance. End of quote. The writings of Andrew Fuller and the practices of Shubal Stearns of Sandy Creek fame changed the hyper-Calvinistic approaches of many early in the days of the 1800s. Benedict offers a perspective on John Leland that proves to be humorous. David Benedict said of John Leland that he, although a Calvinist, he was not one of the straightest class. Two grains of Arminianism with three grains of Calvinism he thought would make a tolerably good compound. End of quote. 
Calvinism among the Baptists was probably at its height in the late 1700s and early 1800s. By the time of the early days of the modern mission movement, William Carey and Luther Rice and the arrival of the Triennial Convention in 1814, the seeds of Calvinism among Baptists had, had uh, softened. I want you to notice what, he, what was taking place. There was a mission movement by men such as Carey and Rice. The Triennial Convention, which was a precursor to the Southern Baptist Convention, was a group focused on getting the gospel to the regions beyond. Let us learn a lesson from that. How do you combat Calvinism? You keep winning people to Jesus. Amen. How do you combat Calvinism? You keep sending missionaries to preach the gospel Amen. of Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. Work then. By the time of the Civil War in 1860, the turbulence of a national conflict over slavery and the internal conflicts which shaped much of the debate. In the 1820s, two major conflicts interrupted the flow of Baptist life. The anti-mission movement and the Campbell controversy concerning baptismal regeneration did not add or take away from a Calvinistic view. The anti-mission movement was a throwback to the debate. However, it changed into a primitive Baptist or a hard shellism debate. Out of it came a whole system of thought that anything of modern convenience should be rejected. But this was not really a Bible debate. This was a cultural and a frontier battle for and against education as it was anything in that era. The landmark controversy of the 1840s and 1850s had more to do with the church than with the doctrines of the Tulip Doctrine and its discussions. After the Civil War and Reconstruction, the Baptists of the South could once again resume their commitment to starting and growing churches. The revivals of the Second Great Awakening and then of D.L. Moody and others influenced attitudes concerning the Calvinism debate within the Calvinism world, or within the Baptist world. This is best illustrated by the fact of the criticism that Moody received by an unknown preacher in England by the name of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Spurgeon would not endorse the revivals of Moody in the 1870s when Moody preached in England. Spurgeon refused to endorse Moody's revivals because of his wide use of public invitations and music sung to entice sinners let me just deviate from my notes a moment and say to you today that I still believe in giving a public invitation. Amen. If you don't expect anything to happen when the Word of God is preached and the Spirit of God is working, then don't give an invitation. But if you believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation and that God calls men to respond openly and publicly, then by the grace of God, you ought to give an invitation. Amen. The desire to reach others with the gospel was always at the forefront of the 1800s and the early 1900s in this discussion. Baptists had two controversies in the late 1800s that contributed to this debate. First, the controversy over gospel missions and T.P. Crawford focused on missions and how to receive the funds. There is a county in Kentucky named Pulaski County, Russell County, right next to it. T.P. Crawford was from that area. He was a missionary in China. And he went to the Southern Baptist Convention and on the floor of the convention urged them to do away with their means of doing mission work and send the money to the missionaries direct. It was called the direct mission movement. He believed that the churches could do better mission work than the cooperative program. And he urged them to send their money direct and they refused to do it. He went back to China to carry on the work of winning people and starting churches. And the only funds he received was that which was sent directly to him from the churches. The second controversy was the Whitson controversy 
over when Baptists started and church succession. When the dust settled on these, hyper-Calvinism among the mainstream Baptist world uh, was gone and evangelism and outreach had come to the forefront. With the firing of Whitsitt by Southern Seminary and the hiring of E.Y. Mullins as president of the school, there came a decided shift in doctrinal emphasis among Baptists. In 1905, with the formation of the General Association of Missionary Baptists uh, in the ABA, and in 1924, came a further separation from the Calvinistic themes of the previous centuries. The revivalism of the early 20th century influenced danger, it influenced Baptists, and the danger then became not a tool of Calvinism, but an easy believism marked by an even younger age for baptismal candidates. Both are wrong. The Baptist in the United States saw this consistent struggle finally culminate in the 60s and early 70s in the writings of Dale Moody, president of Southern Seminary. Moody advocated the apostasy of believers in his writings and his systematic theology. This was quite a turn from the writings of John Gill, John Broadus, and J.P. Boyce. Even the writings of Dag and Carroll and others would not have agreed. So where does this leave us today in the debate? Calvinism is on the rise in the Baptist world. Calvinism may not be right where you are, but I can tell you it will be shortly. So the question is, as we gave up an overview of the history of Calvinism among Baptists, is are Baptist Calvinists? And the answer is no. Historically, have Baptists been Calvinistic? And the answer is yes and no. Some of them have been. Do we believe in predestination and election? Yes. Do we believe in free will and choice? Yes. Do we believe men are dying and need the gospel? Yes. Do we believe we are called to preach the gospel to every creature? Yes. Do we believe that all men can be saved? Yes. Do we also believe that a person must be convicted and drawn by the Holy Spirit of God before they can be saved? Do we believe that Jesus died for all men? Yes. My charge to you tonight is this. Let's just be Baptist. Amen. Amen. We're not Calvinist. You're right. I hope to demonstrate tomorrow that I'm not any points Amen. of Calvinist. Amen. Some of our Baptist brethren say, well, I'm a two-point Calvinist. Well, I'm a zero-point Calvinist. Amen. I hope to show you why tomorrow. Amen. Amen. We are not Reformed theologians. And I can prove it to you. We are not Reformed theologians because we believe in a regenerated church membership. Let me tell you why so many of our Baptist churches have hell in their business meetings. Because they got lost church members. If they wasn't lost, God would have done killed them for the way they live. <laughs> We believe in a regenerated church membership. We do not believe in infant baptism. Amen. We do not believe in sacerdotal ordinances. Right. <coughs> we are not Calvinists. That's right. We are not Armenians who believe that you can be saved one day and lose your salvation right. the next day. Amen. Amen. We are Baptists. Yes. Beware Calvinism on several fronts. Calvinism will deter missionaries in. I remember a few years ago that the Southern Baptist Convention was lamenting the fact that the number of baptisms was down. And great concern swept their preachers over their preachers and churches as well it should. But in my humble opinion, the greater influence Calvinism has among churches, the fewer baptisms they will see. There is a correlation. Calvinism will deter our missionary zeal. It will cause journeys into pedo-baptism 
and wrong church polity. Let us remain true to the Bible and the requirements of Scripture over men. Have Baptists been influenced by Calvinism? Absolutely. Is it in our history? Most definitely it is. That's the honest to God truth. But that doesn't mean that they believe in into baptism, and it doesn't mean they believe in the ordinances were means of grace. I'm telling you today there is an alternative. You don't have to choose Arminianism over Calvinism or vice versa. You can be a Bible-believing Baptist. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And Lord, we pray that you would break our hearts for the souls of men. We pray, Father, that uh, we would take seriously the command that you've given us to be witnesses unto you. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to have compassion for those who are without Christ. And Lord, it does very little good to say we're not Calvinists if we're not going to go. It's not going to do us any good, Lord, to say we believe Christ died for the sins of the whole world. If we don't seek to get the whole world the gospel message. Don't let us be hypocrites. Don't let us be closet Calvinists who refuse to share your life with those who are lost. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.